In the spring of 1945, American troops had begun to conquer the Third Reich from the west, town by town, village by village. Their advance was filmed by a few dozen cameramen working on behalf of the US Army. Embedded in the Army units, these cameramen shot over 1,000 spools of film, which today lie in storage in the US National Archives in Washington, DC. The footage is momentous. It documents the victory and the defeat, the death and the desperation, the liberation and the ruin. Operation Grenade was launched at 2.45 a.m. local time. 300,000 soldiers of the U.S. 1st and 9th Armies were to cross the Ruhr River over a 70-kilometer long line for the final battle against the Third Reich. The Americans had already reached the small river west of Cologne in December 1944, but the German offensive in the Ardennes had held up the advance. Now, two months later, the Allies were prepared for the crucial blow against the Nazi regime. The German troops on the other side of the river comprised approximately 30,000 men, supported by 70 tanks according to US Secret Service estimations. The attack had been postponed for two weeks, as the Germans had destroyed the dams upstream in the Eiffel region, and the rivulet had become a raging torrent. U.S. artillery had been relentlessly shelling the town of Duran for days. The majority of the town's population of 30,000 had been evacuated or had fled to safer areas. The Allied artillery fire had become so unremitting that the supplies of troops and materials to the front had to be suspended so as not to put their own men at risk from friendly fire. At dawn, however, soldiers in assault boats crossed the river. During the morning, they cautiously ventured into the devastated town. Among the first soldiers to reach Duran was cameraman Hartmann, who filmed the risky mission. The Americans met strong resistance. Many GIs were wounded or killed by plastic mines. Crossing of the Ruhr was no picnic, said Hollywood filmmaker Sam Fuller about that day. Even today, after all these years, the veterans refer to this battle as the Bloody Ruhr. The Germans, too, suffered heavy losses. Scattered units with their wounded escaped the worst by surrendering to the Americans. Further north, reinforcement units of the US 84th Infantry Division reached the town of Linich.
Just as in Duren, assault troops here crossed the Ruhr River at dawn and surprised a German infantry division of General Köchling's 81st Corps. The official Wehrmacht report of the following day read, Fierce fighting has erupted on the eastern bank of the Ruhr River near Linich, Julich and Duren. However, the enemy was unable to penetrate further into any of our main positions. The Wehrmacht chroniclers were not too far from the truth. Particularly in Jülich, the US troops faced vehement resistance. Photographer George Silk from Life magazine was there as the GIs fought their way into the town, taking building after building. Times journalist reported for the readers back home on that day. After our troops crossed the Ruhr early today, they were able to gain one or two miles of land east of the river by dusk. It was something like a second D-Day. In Jülich, the Americans managed to secure a bridgehead overnight. Fresh troops were moved into the town via pontoon bridges. The GIs witnessed a picture of total devastation. Jülich no longer existed. The town had been under bombardment for months, the target of countless artillery shells and aircraft bombs. The last remaining inhabitants had been evacuated from Jülich in December 1944. In this heap of ruins, the German defenders had entrenched themselves and fought a senseless battle against the Americans over mountains of rubble. Years later, an observer raised the following question in the face of the destruction. Is there anyone who has the courage to start anew in a place that looks worse than a ravaged cemetery? Is it not imaginable that the people of Jülich, despite their love of their hometown, would turn away from it, as happened with Sodom and Gomorrah? The price the victors had to pay for the success of their operation was also dear. In just one day, they counted 2,400 casualties. The American cameramen were actually not allowed to film footage of dead GIs. The few frames that were shot nonetheless were naturally never shown at home. For some days now, the Americans have been moving heavy equipment across the Ruhr for their further onslaught toward the Rhine. A US Army cameraman advancing with the 84th Infantry Division reached Baal, a small place near Ekelenz, which had been the theater of fierce fighting. Using mortars and smoke grenades, the GIs secured the northeast bound traffic routes towards Mönchengladbach and Dusseldorf, the next cities to be taken. The German commander, General Gustav Adolf von Zangen, had initially hoped that the Americans would concentrate their efforts on Cologne. By the time he sent an infantry unit, which was already weakened by heavy fighting in the Alsace, to defend the area, it was already much too late.
The Nazi Gauleitung have been distributing flyers with fanatic holdout appeals to stir up the population of the entire Rhineland for the oncoming battle. The enemy is trying with a storm to make inroads into our homeland. Behind the Americans lurk the Jews as occupation army officers, military policemen and economic exploiters, waiting for the hour of their revenge. There is only one thing we can do to shatter the intentions of our enemies. Fight with all available means, with all our weapons, with our last ounce of strength. The propaganda had hit its target. A German private wrote to his family back home. The Americans are expecting us to lay down our arms, but they're dead wrong. It's true that things look bad, very bad. But I'm still confident that we will win the war nonetheless. Curious but distant at the same time, the American camera crew made contact with the civilian population in Baal for the first time. The desperate determination of some Germans in those days is revealed in a letter a father wrote to his son on the battlefield. We cannot face a daunting end. Therefore, we should rather fight on, so that our people are not at the mercy of an enemy who cannot be measured with conventional yardsticks. More powerful than fate is the man who bears it courageously. The inhabitants of the surrounding villages were herded together for security purposes and taken to Ekelens, where they would remain in custody for 10 days. Time and again on the 27th of February 1945, the Americans encountered resistance by small German armored units or thrown together groups of Wehrmacht and Volkssturm men. These, however, could do little more than needle the superior US Army. The American bridgehead east of the Ruhr River had become invulnerable. Operation Grenade was a total success. Hitler's soldiers did not know their Fuhrer's whereabouts. It was said that he was in one of his headquarters. In reality, however, he commanded the remaining troops from the bunker of the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. Despite his orders that capitulation to the enemy carried the death sentence, more and more units were surrendering to the Allies without resistance. However, confidence in their supreme commander still seemed to exist with some people. A letter written by a soldier reads, The Fuhrer is not a rogue. He is not so bad that he would lead a whole nation to its demise. So far, the Fuhrer has always given us his love and promised us liberty, and all his plans have come to fruition. On that day, an American unit reached the Arnoldsweiler concentration camp near Duren. Only a few dozen Polish and Russian slave laborers were still there to celebrate their liberation. Up until the very end, they thought they would not live to see the end of the war. The number of slave laborers who paid for the brutal treatment in Arnoldsweiler with their lives was unclear at the time. The scale of the terror became known only in 1960 when 1,500 skeletons of former forced laborers were found in a mass grave.
The Wehrmacht report concerning the west of the Reich was monosyllabic on that day. The breakthrough attempts of the enemy through position number two have so far been of only local significance. They were intercepted by counterattacks. We have succeeded in keeping the front intact. The American units continued to advance without encountering serious resistance. These images are from the small village of Fettweiss near Duren, which infantry units had taken after a short battle on the previous day. The signs of total warfare were still visible here. Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels noted in his diary on the 28th of February 1945, we must be like Frederick the Great once was and follow his example in resolve. The Führer agrees with me totally when I tell him that it should be our ambition to ensure that our grandchildren can refer to us as an heroic example of determination should a similar crisis strike Germany one day, maybe in 150 years. Thompson captured some very moving scenes of zero hour in the village of Hinsbeck, west of Krefeld. On that 2nd of March, a young woman wrote in her diary, It pains me, for in my soul I am still German. I went inside and wept in my room. It's a strange and bitter feeling seeing the enemy in our country. I constantly think of my husband Rudy. I don't know where he is now or how he's coping. When will all this end? A large-scale attack on the fourth largest city of the Reich was launched at 7 a.m. Entering from the northwest, an assault unit of the U.S. 3rd Armored Division with backup provided by snipers combed the Cologne suburb of Bocklemund. On the day before, a Nazi party official had demanded that Commander General Köchling defend Cologne to the last man standing. He told Köchling that the bazookas of the Volkssturm should be able to hold back the American tanks. The GIs have been told that the Germans will probably offer little resistance. Yet, as soon as the US troops reached the city boundary, they became engaged in a fervent battle. Cameraman Walter Rosenblum shot these extraordinary images at the risk of his own life when German 88mm guns opened fire. At the end, the inadequately armed police and Volkssturm units could not persist against the 30-ton heavy Sherman tanks and had to surrender. Straße, the US 3rd Armored Division moved into Bickendorf, another Cologne suburb. A 
An eyewitness remembered later how she felt on that 5th of March. I was overcome by a strange feeling. It was relief mixed with fear. I was relieved that everything would be over soon. The relentless air raids and the endless sleepless nights of the last weeks and months. But I was also scared because the Nazi propaganda had been continuously reporting Allied atrocities in the press and on the radio, rapes and abductions. However, we soon found out that the Americans were not the monsters the Nazis had claimed them to be. In order not to run the risk of being hit by ricochet shots, the civilians had once again to find refuge in the air raid shelters, where they had already spent so many nights of bombing. By dusk, the Americans would have advanced to the ring road encircling the old town. Cologne's landmark was now within sight. The US 3rd Armored Division units met with a dreary sight in the center of Cologne. The church towers were the only orientation points. After countless nights of bombing, the old town had been reduced to heaps of rubble. A US soldier said later, he came to a dead city. How many German troops may have been entrenched in the houses was unclear. Snipers could have been lurking anywhere. Anyone who got in the sights of the GIs was fired upon instantly. Two cameramen were accompanying the US forces on that day, Bates and Rosenblum. They captured spectacular house-to-house -house fighting scenes from close up. The majority of the population had long been evacuated or had fled to the other side of the Rhine. Several thousand had been dwelling in cellars for months. As a precaution, the Americans searched every building. A young woman in her car was caught in crossfire at Christophstrasse and had to be rescued. Her companion was not so fortunate. During the early afternoon, Sherman tanks cautiously approached the cathedral square, where another pocket of resistance was expected. Suddenly, soldiers armed with bazookas and a German tank appeared and started firing at the Americans. A Sherman was hit full on. Two crew members died on the spot. The commander bled to death. A few minutes later, a US armored unit approached the site and attacked the German Panzer. That had taken position at the end of Komödienstrasse. Three soldiers managed to escape from the burning vehicle and were shot on the street. Its commander burnt inside the tank. The cameramen have managed to take up position in time to capture these dramatic images.
5 p.m. on the 6th of March 1945, the war was over in Cologne. The Americans had now reached the Rhine. just a brief comment on the events of the previous day. The pile of rubble that was once Cologne was left to the enemy. American journalist Janet Flanner went to Cologne a few days after its capture by the Allies. She noted, reduced to rubble, and in the isolation of total physical destruction, Cologne, a city without any shape or features, leans on its riverbank. Those who have remained here laboriously battle their way through the blocked side streets. A diminished population, dressed in black and loaded with bundles, quiet like the city itself. Most of the inhabitants of Cologne don't have much to say. Numbed by a week of defeat, three years of bombing, and 12 years of propaganda, the old men, the women, and the children who now live in the city seem to have lost the ability to think reasonably or to tell the truth. Capturing Cologne, the Americans had achieved an important goal in their campaign. Yet there were many more cities, towns and villages to be taken before Adolf Hitler and his Third Reich were defeated. Everywhere the troops arrived, they first searched all buildings for arms. These are images from Mechenich, on the northern fringe of the Eiffel region. Every uniformed man aroused suspicion even if they were just employees of the Reich Railways. Nazi officials may have been lurking in disguise in civilian clothes anywhere. Often, the locals had to resort to their meager school English to mollify the GIs. The caution of the US troops was justified they came across Wehrmacht units on an almost daily basis. And it wasn't always that Hitler's soldiers surrendered so readily and without resistance. Soldiers of the US 94th Infantry Division had dug themselves in near the village of Lampardon, south of Trier. Fierce fighting had been raging here for two days. On Hitler's orders, Wehrmacht and SS units had attacked the supply lines of the Americans at dawn. Both sides suffered heavy losses. The Germans lost 800 men in this senseless massacre. The US Army cameraman captured these scenes too. Two days prior to that, the Americans had taken control of the first undestroyed bridge over the Rhine at Remagen. Its demolition had been prevented at the last moment. Advancing troops captured the passage without resistance. The scene was re-enacted on the spot for cameraman Geddix on that Friday the 9th of March. Within 24 hours, 8,000 GIs reached the right, the east side of the river, and established a bridgehead. Hitler was enraged. He had the people responsible tried by a drumhead court-martial. Four officers were executed. One managed to flee into the hands of the Americans. A 
nigh on endless convoy of military vehicles jammed the narrow streets of Remagen. Because the Ludendorff Bridge was considered increasingly unstable, heavy equipment had to be transferred to the other side of the Rhine over a pontoon bridge. The entry in Propaganda Minister Goebbels' diary for that day was skeptical. Alarming news came from Eisenhower's headquarters. Apparently, the Americans succeeded in establishing a small bridgehead on the right bank of the Rhine. I cannot corroborate the news, as connection with the West has not been functioning. But I consider it quite impossible. Raymargen had now become a main target of German air raids and V-2 missiles. However, only few bombs struck home and merely delayed the construction of the pontoon bridge. The Ludendorff Bridge remained intact. Despite their losses, the Americans were able to consolidate their bridgehead. A German soldier wrote to his wife on that day, it has become an unequal battle of one to 100. We shoot once and we receive a barrage of 100 shots. What kind of war is this? Further on he added, don't let our dear relatives and friends make you falter. At the end, victory will be ours, and those who are in doubt today will later be the first to claim that they had known it all along. The GIs used the opportunity of a break between battles for a quick dip in the Rhine. Somewhere in American-occupied Germany, a US cameraman filmed these extraordinary scenes. German soldiers had surrendered to the enemy and were being searched. During this time, a Wehrmacht captain wrote to his family, we have some peace at the moment because enemy pressure is concentrated in the north. We've lost some people, others have been detached, and the valuable materials have been taken back behind our lines. Sooner or later, we will be cornered. I've stopped thinking of leave for a long time. Traveling is pointless, dangerous, and far too many people are always on the road. A total ban on leave until the end of the war is quite reasonable. It's also part of total warfare. And he continued, Before, when the war was fought in foreign countries where one could see so many interesting things, the situation was different. Now when one sees the villages falling into the hands of the enemy one after the other, German families digging holes in the ground like the Russians and living in them in order to avoid the bombs, cattle being buried alive in the stables because they couldn't be taken away in time, and the hope rising among the population that the Americans will come and occupy us before everything goes to ruin, it's very difficult to conceal one's despondency. US commander George S. Patton had been enviously noting the success of the 9th Army in Cologne and Remagen. The advance of his 3rd Army from France towards Cologne was at first met with strong resistance from Wehrmacht and SS units. In mid-March, however, the offensive gained momentum and Patton's armored divisions overran the entire region known as the Saar-Palatinate Triangle within a few days.
tens of thousands of German soldiers were taken prisoner. Many were immediately questioned by US Army officers. Every witness report could supply valuable information. On that 15th of March, Josef Goebbels wrote in his diary of a discussion he had with the armaments minister. Speer is of the opinion that economically the war is lost. The German economy could keep up recent output for another four weeks. After that, it would gradually collapse. Speer regrets that the Führer cannot reach a decision on the most important issues. He believes that his physical handicap has caused the Führer to lose much of his vigor. Speer's opinion on sustaining the basics of life for the German people is correct. He is adamantly against the scorched earth policy. He explained that if the population's lifelines regarding nutrition and economy were to be cut off, this should not be our task, but the task of our enemies. An advance commando of the US 87th Infantry Division crossed the Mosul River near Koblenz. Cameraman Cummings was accompanying them. The defense of the inner city was left to 2,000 Wehrmacht soldiers under Lieutenant Colonel Löffler. The Americans already knew, having interrogated German prisoners of war, that they were not to meet too fierce a resistance. A classified report summarized, the morale of the German soldiers is very low. The only exception is some fanatics. The German soldiers cannot understand why their commanders send them to battle with inferior arms against the obvious superiority of the US Army. Civilians urge the soldiers to surrender without resistance so as to spare their houses and villages from destruction. Still, the elite US unit tentatively groped their way into the Koblenz district of Moselweis. German units determined to fight until the end, or snipers, could be lurking anywhere. The Ludendorff Bridge in Remagen had been closed for some days due to danger of collapse. It collapsed on that day, 17th of March, just after 3 p.m. Cameraman Evans was on site not long after the incident in order to film the rescue operations. Some 200 engineers were doing repair work as they heard steel breaking and the bridge began to quiver. Many of them didn't manage to get away before the bridge collapsed. Twenty-five U.S. soldiers died on the spot. Another three succumbed to their injuries later. Eighteen bodies couldn't be recovered.
U.S. artillery have been shelling the center of Koblenz for the last 24 hours in order to clear the ground for the entry of the U.S. 87th Infantry Division. The U.S. Army cameramen were on duty during the house-to-house -house fighting as well. Occasionally, German soldiers capitulated, showing the passes the Americans had been dropping over the enemy lines in the last few days. However, the last pockets of resistance in Koblenz wouldn't be extinguished until the following day. On that 18th of March, a young German sergeant wrote in his diary, Wherever we look during these spring weeks, we see the destruction of our country escalating day by day. We must steel ourselves more than ever before against this reality. As far as one can predict, this war will not end with an armistice agreement, but only when the resistance of the last division in the last corner of the Reich has been broken. This armored unit entered the destroyed village of Rhine Brohl on the right bank of the Rhine. The Americans expected to find a fortified pocket of resistance here, as the Germans had been moving their only heavy gun into new positions for over a week. The civilian population was anxious for the fighting to end, yet the German commander, a fanatic first lieutenant, had categorically refused to capitulate. He'd even had a white flag pulled down, which some courageous villagers had hoisted on top of the church tower. At the end, Hitler's soldiers had to surrender to the superiority of the enemy. The Americans remained cautious and had the village evacuated. Cameraman Geddix filmed the operation. By then, the inhabitants had realized that for them, the war was over. They had survived. That day saw the first of Hitler's so-called Nero decrees to be issued from the bunker of the Reich Chancellery. All military transport and communication facilities, industrial establishments and supply depots, as well as anything else of value within Reich territory, which could in any way be used by the enemy immediately or within the foreseeable future for the prosecution of the war, will be destroyed. U.S. Commander George S. Patton had been enviously noting the success of the 9th Army in Cologne and Remagen. The advance of his 3rd Army from France toward the Rhine met with strong resistance from Wehrmacht and SS units. In mid-March, however, the offensive gained momentum and Patton's armored divisions overran the entire region north of the Moselle River, known as the saar palatinate Triangle, within a few days. On the morning of the 20th of March, 1945, the Third Army reached Zweibrücken. The city was taken without resistance. The US Air Force had bombed the city on the evening of the 14th of March, leaving behind a field of rubble. After the raid, the Nazi commanders of the city removed their uniforms, medals and decorations 
fleeing in civilian clothes. Some party members who had come to volunteer for battle were sent home by an official. Go away and get yourselves to safety. Or do you believe that you can still win the war? Just before the US 3rd Infantry Division entered the city, some determined women were clearing away tank traps so to demonstrate their good intentions to the Americans. Despite the goodwill gestures, all civilians were herded together on Homburger Straße and evacuated. The GIs were worried about snipers hiding in the ruins. The cameraman called Russ Meyer was on duty in the administrative district of Kuzel on that 20th of March. In later years, he gained a name in Hollywood as the director of sex films. He filmed these scenes in which French prisoners of war, together with the local population, greet the Americans in the small village of Brücken. Meyer said at a later point that he would not have hesitated to pick up a rifle and fight the Nazis if he hadn't had to operate a camera. Meyer also filmed this footage in a different location. Here, the locals greeted the American troops as their liberators. He may have used his talent in directing to make the scene more credible. In any case, nothing here recalls the fact that the German units stationed in this area had just retreated in great haste. The streets outside the village were strewn with wrecks of vehicles that had been shot to pieces. Bodies of fallen soldiers and animal carcasses lay everywhere. Symbolic images of a broken nation. It would be best to forget these days, to wipe them from memory completely, wrote a German soldier in desperation to his wife on that day. German engineers had blown up the Ernst Ludwig Bridge in Worms on the previous day. Shortly afterwards, the Americans captured the old city of emperors. Patton's army had now reached the Rhine too. The US 11th Armored Division took control of a pile of rubble. Two thirds of all buildings in Worms had been damaged or destroyed. On the 21st of February, the city had been the target of an all night British air raid. And two days before the marching in of the troops, the US Air Force had bombarded it again with high explosive bombs. Nierstein, south of Mainz, resembled an army camp. Five hundred boats had been in operation since 10 p.m. in order to take the first engineer units across the Rhine. The Germans offered no resistance. It was a surprising maneuver by General Patton, as the British and the Canadians on the Lower Rhine would begin the crossing of the river only on the following night. It had been exactly four weeks since the Americans launched their large-scale offensive at Duren. In those four weeks, the Allies had managed to take control of extensive parts of Western Germany. At the Eastern Front, the Red Army had reached the Oder River. 
An SS man who had barely managed to flee across the Rhine wrote to his wife on that day, we are the men the Americans fear the most. We have no option other than to win or die. Just 40 kilometers away from Nierstein in Frankfurt am Main, a young woman wrote in her diary, we're sitting here waiting for the Americans. For the first time in years, I can reflect again on world history and how it has so often been shaped by power-hungry fools. If it wasn't so tragic because of all the lives it has cost, it would be funny. Taking village after village, the American troops continued their advance on the other side of the Rhine. A German corporal noted in his diary, the opinion prevails that we are now at the beginning of the decisive battle. The enemy has crossed the river at three separate sections. A decree from the Führer read out on 22nd of March before the entire assembled battery threatens anyone taken prisoner by the enemy with grave consequences if they are either unwounded or haven't fought to the end. Apart from the fact that he would forfeit his honor, his dependents would lose all financial support and other benefits. His family would become liable for his actions. Acknowledgements of the order had to be confirmed by signature. US Army commanders celebrated the success of their campaign on the Petersburg near Bonn. Commander-in-Chief Dwight D. Eisenhower had invited his generals to dinner. Eisenhower knew that his mission was not yet accomplished. On the first day of his campaign, he had written to his brother Milton, Hitler should beware of the wrath of a roused democracy. The war in Germany would last another 43 days.